This is The Extra Mile. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Extra Mile. I'm Caleb Spear along with G5. Per usual, a G5, but we are not alone today. We, we'd like to thank and introduce you to brother and elder C.D. Cash. How are you doing today, very sir? Very well, thank you. Doing very well. Thank you so much for coming on today. I know we're going to benefit a lot um, from your life and the wisdom you have to share, but thank you very much for coming on. Very grateful for that. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. And so we're just going to talk a we're just gonna have a conversation with cd we're gonna try to gain some wisdom and some biblical knowledge uh, about life and god that we can pull some application from and and we hope that you you enjoy Mm -hmm. so uh, without trying to be rude or without trying to date you but would you mind telling everyone uh when and where you were born how old are you sir i was born in knox county texas uh in 1926, oh. I'm uh, 95 years old, headed for 96, if the Lord lets me make it. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, we were just talking about this before we started recording, where you, you were raised here in, in... We moved out of Knox County in, in 1928 to okay. Crosby County, and they lived there uh, except time spent. World War Two. I spent two years in the in, uh, Navy in World War Two. Mm. Nineteen months in the South Pacific. In the South Pacific. Wow. Now, before we would love to hear about that. Before we get there, I know you would have been pretty young. Do you remember anything about the Great Depression there in the 1930s? What are <laughs> some of your memories that you think that you recall? Well, uh, yes. Um, most everybody was short on money then, <laughs> you know. That's what I hear. Yeah, they said bacon and beans most every day. You soon to be eating Perrier. Oh man! But, wow. Uh, the, the the school teachers, you know, they got not all of them, but some of them got vouchers, mm. and uh, they'd take those and trade them for groceries, and wow. most of the merchants would would discount them, you know. Because they know where they'd be able to collect, but times were hard then. It's different then. Yeah, uh, money wise, a lot of good people, a lot of good people went hungry. <laughs> mm. Now in West Texas, I don't know the time frame exactly, but would that be during like the the Dust Bowl and things like that? Would that be going on? Yeah. Uh, yes. They, uh, north of us was probably a lot worse than here. Oh. When you get into southern. Southeastern Colorado and the panhandle of Oklahoma and, and uh, uh, North Texas around Del Hart and oh, okay. that part of the country. They had uh, a lot of dust, a lot, you know, it was the dunes that really accumulate. Yeah. Because of the inability to, to plow, didn't have the good uh, tillage tools that they have today. Hmm. That's a good point. Now, at what point in your life did you become a believer, a Christian? When did you become a follower of the Lord Jesus? Uh, my parents were members of the Lord's Church. Okay. And I was, uh, when I was, uh, I think I was 13 years old then. 13. So it could have been, it's in the spring of year, right? It could have been 14. Okay. Wow. So you, you, you've been a... Uh... You've been a, a Christian for a long time. You've had a long time yes. to mature your faith and your relationship with Jesus, and I imagine that's uh, that's had a pretty big impact in your life. Um, yeah. So you had just mentioned that you spent a significant amount of time. You said in the South Pacific. When how old were you uh, when you went into the military? When you went into the Navy? How, how did that all unfold? What's that story? Well, they, they drafted everyone. You know, when they got to be eighteen, if he's physically able, okay. uh, I volunteered when I was eighteen and, and went into the Navy. Volunteered because I had a choice of where to go, Army or Navy, and, and I wanted the Navy. You went Navy. Well, why did you choose Navy? 
Didn't have to walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all about riding. Man. I was on an aircraft carrier for a while, and I was in the Admiralty's for a while, and then New Guinea. New Guinea, okay. And wow. then, then I went aboard the uh, USS Birmingham, CR-62. Spent six, seven months on it. So where were you the day that you heard? I guess it would be two different days. Where were you when you heard that uh, Nazi Germany had surrendered? And then where were you when you heard that uh, Japan had surrendered? I was in a land in New Guinea, the okay. Dutch New Guinea both times. Both New Guinea. And do you? How, how did you hear about that? Was it some sort of announcement, like more like gossip, or was there like an official statement? How did you learn about that? Uh, I, I don't know. You don't, I remember? don't remember? Long time. Man. And so when you came, when you came back, uh, what did life look like after the Navy? What did you do? What happened next in your life? Uh, of course, I had, I had no education. Hmm. And... Uh, I went into custom uh, harvesting, uh, wheat harvest and cotton harvest. In uh, 47, we bought a, well, I guess you might say one of the first uh, uh, tractor-mounted cotton strippers that was being manufactured. Of course, had combines. And uh, we, my dad, had been uh, during the depression, lost his farm, and, and had been doing custom work. And uh, 1939, we we went to uh, uh, when we quit to harvest. We were north of Billings, Montana. Oh, way up there. And huh. and it, of course those old trucks. Then you know different. <laughs> yeah. 1939. It took us seven days to come home. Set. Wow. Oh, wow. Seven days. Yeah. 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 The, the uh, is we spent the night at Harding, Montana, and uh, the two of the guys that was working with my dad were in a beer joint, and uh, one morning about ten o'clock, a Catholic priest came in, and one of those boys was a Catholic. He was raised in a in a covenant, okay. and uh, he said, "Come over here, Father, and I'll buy you a beer." So that priest came over. And, what are you boys doing? Said, oh, our boss is looking for a job cutting wheat. He said, Well, I got 200 acres you can cut. And that was at St. Xavier, 20 miles south of, of Harding on the Little Bighorn River. But they had about 10 or 12 miles from where Custer got annihilated. Oh, you wow. Know? That's crazy. And uh, That's... so we went over and cut that wheat. And uh, we. Uh, we in those days were well, a few work people. They fed you, so we ate with the Catholics. Mm, <laughs> but that, that was real. Advantage. I've been back to three times since then. Oh wow! Well, and that's all there is that Catholic mission is it? Saint that, Xavier. That's all it's there. Well, mm. I know that the military had a huge impact on on you, and uh, you know, I imagine it'd be hard on anyone who had to go through some of what you did. And looking at your military years and your military experience, what did serving in the military really teach you about your commitment to God? Uh, you know, they had we had a uh, a chaplain aboard ship, okay. and uh, but as far as it being a church or really any any religious activity, you know. They wasn't and the priest always showed up when the, I wasn't on the Birmingham. The Birmingham was alongside the Princeton when the Princeton blew up. Mm-hmm. They had been fighting fire. The, the kamikazes hit the Princeton. It was on fire, and they thought the fire was out. And when the Birmingham was up there resting, and the Princeton blew up, there was 265 killed on the Birmingham and over 400 injured. And uh, they took mess tables and put them, 20 of them, and put bodies on those under a flag. And the priest, he said some words, and, and they 
flush them into the ocean, you know. Mm -hmm. But as far as, as having church, I, I, when I went through boot camp, I went with one Catholic boy to, to uh, church one time. And, and of course, they, they used that, uh, what, what language they use anyway, wasn't it? <laughs> like Latin? And, and we, anyway, they uh, stand up and sit down and stand up yeah, and yeah, sit down. Yeah. And old, this boy from, named Nussbaum, Mamrella, he said, Cash, you will stay sitting down. You don't know what's going on anyway. <laughs> and that's, that was right. I didn't. Of course, I had had a Bible. And I, I did study the Bible, but we we had no no church anywhere per se wherever I was. Mm, yeah. Now you, the, you're on duty at you know different times anyway. Yeah. Oh, sure. I mean that makes sense. What were you gonna say? I, I was gonna say now in, in this lifestyle in the Navy and in, in the military, did it change how you viewed God? Did it change your faith? Would you say it strengthened or weakened or changed your view? Like, what would you say about your faith? No, I after? knew God was there. I knew God was there. Mm. Knew He was there. Mm. And have tried to, you know, live faithful since I've been out. My wife wasn't a member of the Lord's Church when we married. Oh, where? So there's another story. Where? Where did you meet your wife? When did you guys get married? Yeah, what's that story? In Crosbyton. Crosbyton. And how old were you two when you? Uh, I was, of course, I was 21, 22. She was 18. 18. And what was her name? Arvella. Arvella. She was a black Dutch. She had the name Mary Arvella Lorraine. <laughs> Uh, we lived that. together 72 years and three months. 70? She died Christmas a year ago. Ah, I'm, I'm very, very sorry. sorry about that. But seven, you said 72 years, three months? That, okay. that is a long time of very long time. faithful commitment. I'm at four years, and that's, that's pretty pitiful. That's, that <laughs> four is pretty years. Pitiful. I'm not even at one year. I, yeah. was, I was married <laughs> just last June the 16th. Ma'am. But just hearing that, with, without even knowing all the details about your life, I find, I know you find it encouraging too, George. Mm -hmm. It's so amazing to see that God's love for us and our love toward each other I've should told last my, that long. I told my boys, I told, I tell my grandkids to marry somebody to help you get to heaven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you marry somebody that loves God and has got it on right, they, they'll help you there. Mm. It, you know, life is difficult regardless. Yeah. You don't give fifty percent; you give a hundred. Mm. I like that. That's really good. Never just giving fifty; always a hundred. So you said, though, correct me if I'm wrong, that when you were married, your your better half, your own flesh, she was not a Christian yet. That's so right. when and how did she become a baptized believer in Jesus? Well, of course, we studied a lot. Yeah, mm. and then of course she goes back to her preacher and her wife and. And visit on different things. And, sure. And uh, uh, I guess it'd be all right to go ahead. And, and, but I told her that we're talking about communion. Oh, yes. And, and what a c communion amounts to. I said, y'all take communion quarterly, but you pass that, that plate for that money every time you meet. Mm -hmm. Now, which is most important, mm -hmm. remembering the Lord's death. Amen. Or that money. Wow. That's a unique way of putting that, actually. Yeah. yeah. That's what I love in 1 Corinthians 11. You see the purpose of the gathering yeah. when they came together was to share the Lord's Supper. Yeah. yeah. That's a beautiful Just testimony to putting that. Putting the priorities in the right order. Yeah. And, and your wife saw that, and that, yeah. that, that helped. Wow. And, and looking at, at your... At your marriage, what was some of the things that you can take away? Like, what's some wisdom? What what's something you could teach us, us people who aren't married very long, about being married? Well, she was she was willing. Mm. She'd do anything. When we married, uh, she'd work in the field. Uh, she worked. We had a cotton stripper, and, and it's different from this today. The, didn't have blowers on them, just dump it back in the trailer <laughs> and scoop it back. Oh, wow. She'd do any of that. And 
and she did with our boys. We we had a farm, and uh, they would hoe. She'd take those boys and they'd hoe. And, and then our grandchildren had four granddaughters that come along. She'd take them out. Uh -huh. and we'd get them up at 6 o'clock in the morning. They'd go hoe, come in at noon and, and fix the lunch, and then they'd play that evening while it's hot, you know. Mm. Oh, wow. So get them in shape. But, so, that's so cool. So they were... She was involved in, yes. in their lives. That's great. And now you, you just said in passing, how many children did you have? Two. Two. Two boys? Two daughter? boys. Yes, sir. And mm -hmm. how many How many grandchildren? Seven. Seven. And then? One boy and six girls. One boy, six girls. <laughs> and then do you have any great-grandchildren? Yes. I don't know. I have several. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe not all that many. Uh, but it takes a little time to Got too many to count. It's like Abraham. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> fruitful, fruitful, and multiply. Now, and talking about uh, your life here and the military and the marriage, all of it being a Christian. But looking back, is there something you wish you could tell your younger self about faith in God? Is there some sort of advice that you wish you could give your younger self and to all young people right now about the faith? Looking back, well. I don't know how to put it in so many words, but mm -hmm. without God, we're nothing. Mm. And that's what what we have to look forward to is is death. Uh, the uh, in Ecclesiastes in the seventh chapter and verses one through four. Look that up, but it says in so many words that. Death is better than than being born. You're absolutely right. Mm. I just taught on this too. The uh, or I think I had it, but I didn't go get over. It. But you're you're absolutely right. It says, "Death is uh, the day of death is what we look forward to than the day of birth." Right? Something like that. Go ahead and see if you can find it, Caleb. Yeah, a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness of face. The heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. I, there it is. It seems, it seems for a younger person, it seems hard to read that. Almost yeah. almost depressing, but with some, with, with some optimism, some, something positive you, you see in that passage. Uh, well, it gives hope. Mm, yeah. Uh, you know, I was thinking about about this interview and and probably questions would be asking all this, but but I'm 95 years old. Mm -hmm. I served as a deacon 10 or 12 years. I served as an elder for 15 years or more longer. Wow. And uh, I wasn't the best elder or deacon that there ever was. Mm. But uh, I, I did the best I, I knew to do. Mm. And uh, the, the uh, I guess what I'm trying to say, when you, when you get old, a lot of times the memory and uh, your thinking of ability is not what it, it once was. Right. And I, I never did think I was the smartest fella <laughs> are the best one that the Lord ever had, but that's where the hope lies in in the hereafter. Mm. And I don't ask for another day. I thank Him for the today, but I don't ask Him for tomorrow, because mm. we got a hope of things. And life eternal is so much better than what we have here. Yeah, it, amen to that. It makes me think of Philippians, I, I believe it's chapter 1, where Paul says, hey, to, to live is Christ when we serve, and the idea of serving we're here, but to die is gain. And Jesus said, don't be, you know, don't be anxious about anything. Tomorrow has its own troubles. Yeah, Matthew uh, 6. Matthew 6. Mm -hmm. um, that puts a whole new perspective on that. That's, the... Uh, my wife was in a uh, had broken a hip and oh was in a How did you do that? 
How did she break yeah. her hip? How did she break her hip? She fell. Oh, man. Uh, it was a, a – it probably was low sodium. Mm, okay. She had a problem with that. But anyway, she was in a care center in Crosbyton getting therapy. And uh, I'd been up there that day, and, of course, I went three or four times a day. And But that day I, I left before her evening meal, which I usually did. And I could always call and call, and we were talking. It was about seven, I guess. And, and uh, she said, uh, "What are you? What are you doing?" I said, "Well, I got my Bible. I'm just fixing to, to continue reading." And she said, "Well, won't you read to me?" I hadn't been reading to her before, before she broke her hip. We read all the time <laughs> of a night, but anyway, she said, "Well, read to me." So I said, "All right." She said, where are you reading? I said, in Ecclesiastes. And the next morning, uh, my other son's second girl came and said, Pop said, the nursing home called and said that Mama wasn't responsive. So we went up there, and and, and after they picked her body up, I go back home, I get my Bible, and I turn to Ecclesiastes 7. Hmm. One and read that again, and that's what I had read to her. <laughs> so it's a real comforting thought, you know. That yeah. so revel so revel uh, revelation. That's where I am. So Ecclesiastes seven is what you had the last thing that you and your yeah. wife had read together. Read to her. It's beautiful. That's amazing. And, and that you were talking about the the hope that we have looking into the future and Revelation twenty one talking about the new heaven, the new earth. I love verse three where. Uh, a loud voice says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. God will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither will there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Such a beautiful picture on the back end of Ecclesiastes 7 on why in this earth it is the day of death is better because of that hope that you're talking about. That's a beautiful story. It is. Yeah. And it makes me very eager. And see, I see, I hope I hope to meet your wife. I'm looking forward to meeting her. If that's how it works. I'm not claiming that I don't know everything back there, but if that's the case You that can't believe beautiful. how good she was. Really? Uh I sent a she picked up two or three girls for years, and it came to the care center to do her or do fingernails at Crosby and then at Rawls. And uh, uh, Robin Robinson, two girls, and the youngest one graduated this year, and I sent me a, a card, so I sent her a card and uh, some money. And she sent me a card back the next day and thanked me for remembering her and but says thank you for sharing our villa with us. Mm. And uh, she said, we loved her and we love you. And they did. They, 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 those girls, after the last two or three years our villa lived, well, she didn't drive. She could drive but didn't drive. Those girls would come and pick her up, mm -hmm. and they'd take her to the nursing homes and, uh, and do that hair, those fingernails, <laughs> or those things. <laughs> but they truly loved her. That's beautiful. They actually showed that, that yeah. love. Um, yeah. Now, it, could, you could, it was Ecclesiastes 7 when it comes to, do you have a favorite Bible verse or passage personally? I know it changes for us a lot, but do you have a favorite Bible verse or passage? No, I don't think I... It's all just too good. <laughs> That's right. It's all just too good. The, um, now, you had mentioned that you said you'd been a deacon for 10 or 12 years, and then obviously following that, you said you've been an elder, a shepherd in the Lord's church for some time. Um, so in being a shepherd in the Lord's church, what did you learn from that? What did you learn as a Christian being a shepherd and as an elder in God's church? 
Well, uh, there's always problems always that problems. you have to contend with. Mm -hmm. And uh, you got to be willing to listen, and you got to be fair. Mm. And God's got to always be present in all of that. <laughs> yes. How, how hard is it to really listen? Because it seems like in our culture, it 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 seems like people are having a hard time listening. How important is it? But 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 how how do we listen? Really, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> That's all right. Well, you're making me think of James one nineteen. Yeah. And being, you know, quick to hear and quick to listen. Uh, when it came to being quick to listen to others, are uh, are you suggesting that your your idea was to listen first before you answered, or because you said listening was really important as yeah. an elder? Yeah, you got if it's a it's, it's a problem, and uh, it needs to be answered. Uh, God's got got the answer, probably to most problems in the, in. Yeah, just open the Bible. Bible. Yeah, open yeah. the Bible. Yeah. Now, we, we've we covered a long span of your time kind of bouncing back and forth yeah, there did. Uh, for sure. Um, but thinking back on the entirety of your life, would you say you saw a time or even a moment where you just saw the, the providence of God? So for an example perhaps of that would be like in our own lives, people have stories uh, or moments in their life where they say, if this would have happened, my life would have been wildly different. God's hand was clearly in it. Do you have a moment like that in your life or something you can look back where you feel like no, you saw can, God's hand? I can't put anything together on it. <laughs> it's dumb. <laughs> too, many, too many questions. That's all right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a question answer for that one yet either. Uh, I don't either. I don't, have enough, I don't have enough years, but it seems like, you know, God really touched your life and, and had it impact your entire life. And it kind of goes back to Ecclesiastes 3. There's a time for everything. And mm -hmm. and no matter what time we're in, as long as we allow God to be in that time. Yes, yes. So what when it comes to your faith, and like obviously we said we have faith in God, we're not... Um, we're not doubting anything. Oh, we got a technical difficulty. You okay? You okay? We had a hearing aid. Problem. Hearing, hearing oh. aid <laughs> difficulty. It, that, is this what Paul had in mind when he said to die is gain? Is this, <laughs> That's right. He was like, forget that stuff. You all good to go? I think most of the the problems that we experienced while I was serving as elder was uh, on marriage. Marriage. Mm. Uh, and uh, on the class question on the kitchen some uh, bodies you know the Lord's people don't believe in having a, a kitchen oh yeah, yeah. yeah and some don't believe in the Bible class mm -hmm. some want to, want to use the one cup mm. there's, there's things like that you contend with your marriage it and uh, I think there's most of the things that yeah would come up. Yeah. Looking at looking at all those things and looking at your experience in the military and the different cultures and different types of Christianity, different types of faith that you experienced, how important is unity in the body of Christ? You got to learn to love your neighbor. Mm. Yes. Mm. Uh, there is a book that I have, and I can't tell you the name of it. I can't tell you who wrote it. But this man believes that all the Lord's people should unite. Uh, he's uh, in, in discarding, I guess, the, uh, the class, the cup, mm -hmm. that, that sort of thing. Right. And, uh, he believes that our brother should re unite. Uh, he don't know, think that's a, a issue with would be an issue with the Lord. Mm. Mm. And it, it really makes sense. Of course, it's the, the the marriage and sexuality is, you know, that talks much about that or more than anything else in the, really? the Bible. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
It does talk a lot about that. Well, as also Ecclesiastes would state, there's truly nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. Each generation and God's people has to strive with issues like this to seek out truth while still maintaining and seeking out the unity that Jesus prayed for us to have, I believe, in John 17. And you said you spent 15 years as an elder? Yes. 15 years. That's, that's a long time. And was that, was that in Crosby Town? Yes. Okay, in Crosby Town. George, you got a, a question for us? It seems like your whole life, sir, is, is you're humble. You're a humble man, and I admire that. And it seems like your whole life is dedicated to service. We see service in the military, service to family, service to your your wife as a as a companion, and and service as to the body as a deacon and then an elder. Yeah. And now serving us with your with your wisdom and and everyone who's listening. Uh, how has that shaped your faith? Has it grown your faith? With well, I don't know what it has. Yeah. We've always tried to to be faithful. I, I've, when uh, they decided that we would have uh, uh, well, I don't know how to word it, but anyway, the church here at Crosden decided that they would have uh, uh, more elders. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I didn't place my name in for renewal. Mm. Uh, I had been there that long, and had, uh, we desired to travel. And uh, I was in three outfits and while I was in service, and they all have reunion every year. And I oh. made a lot of reunions to Ocean that way and this way and that way and all over the United States. Yeah. Uh, so, but anyway, we went talked to a lot, went to church a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been church in Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh, oh. wow, it's way up there. <laughs> and, uh, I've seen the southern lights and I've seen the northern lights. I've been in Hobart, Tasmania. Whoa, that's, that's crazy. That's, that's, and I've been in Melbourne and Sydney and, and uh, Brisbane, Cairns. You've seen so much. I don't know if I've ever heard... Of some, well, personally, I don't know if I've ever met someone who's seen both the northern and the southern lights. I hear everyone seeing the northern lights. Where yeah. did you see? Where Where did you see the southern lights? Hobart, uh, Hobart, Tasmania. Hobart, Tasmania. Okay, Tasmania. Okay, that makes sense. Tasmania is off the of Australia, coast right? Of Australia. Yes. Okay. I didn't realize you could see. I guess that makes sense. Way down there, and so and. That's a, that's a lot of people in creation. It makes me think of Romans 1. It speaks to a creator uh, with God. Now, in might have been when you were young or older. It could have been a couple different people. Uh, who would you say had the biggest impact uh, when it comes to being an example as a faithful Christian? Who was the example for you? Well, that my you parents. Were, your parents? Yeah. What was your parents? Okay. And then with your parents... Uh, your, your mom and dad, did you, so you left at, were you 17 or 18 when you joined the Navy? 18. You were 18, so you were 18, and then you came back and were on your own. Were you close with your parents afterwards when you moved out and when you came back home? Oh, well, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. For a time. Uh, <clears throat> but my parents are good people, weren't mm. educated, you know, back in those days, um, Back in 19, early 1900s, yeah. you know, two or three years in, in school. And mm, really? That's all they had. They could read and write and all that. My my dad was a good song leader. Ah. <laughs> he just run that scale, do me me for so Latino. <laughs> you know, he'd take a song book and, and pick a song out that he didn't know, and he could sing it in just a little bit. Wow. Could sing all parts. Didn't even need the pitch pipe. Yeah. Alto, soprano, tenor, or the bass. Wow. And That's amazing. My mother was a good alto singer, mm. and, and my boys are good s- singers, yeah. and their wives are. They, they went to LCU. Uh, Terry's wife went to LCU and, and also to Tech, mm. and Gary's wife just went to, to LCU. 
Wow. But they, they're good people. What, so what stood out about your, you said your parents were the ones who gave you faith as the examples. What about their faith in Christ? What about them being Christians did you see specifically that impacted you? Well, they were faithful. They would go to church, you know. My mother was good to help people. Mm. So there's a serving others and consistency when it comes to doing the things God would like us to do. Well, I think one of the last things, or maybe the last thing you're thinking, George, unless you, unless you got something else. No, go ahead. I think perhaps the last question we'll ask, very generic and broad, would be what advice do you have for uh, the future generations when it comes to the church and the leadership in the church? What advice would you leave for us when it comes to living the consistent, faithful life to the Lord? Always put Christ first. Mm, first and foremost, Christ first. Simple but super important. Yeah. And, and necessary to unity, too. And necessary to unity. When Christ is at the center, that will be the case. Well, thank you so much for spending your time and sharing your life and wisdom with us. We're really grateful. Thank you, CD. Appreciate that. You can go through and prune it. No, no, no. <laughs> It'll we, be good. We like it unedited and, and genuine. That's right. <laughs> Raw. Thank you for coming. Robert. And uh, and thank you for your service with our nation, and thank you very much for your service in the kingdom and spending your time here. Yes, thank you. I think that's a wrap. That's a wrap, everyone. Bye. Bye. Go so. Mm-hmm.